for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So I'm going to maybe take a different tack today. I'm to, to contribute to this debate around cybersecurity. So I'm going to I'm going to tell a story about Tom and how he's been impacted by technological changes over the last couple decades. But before I tell Tom's story, I actually got to share Emily's story around technology and why this legislation and ch needed changes to cybersecurity in Canada is so important and so needed. So before I get into that, I think it's important to first lay out in simple terms what this bill is about from my current understanding. There's really two parts to the bill. The first part is amending the Telecommunications Act to address and fix needed security of our Canadian telecom uh, telecommunications system. So the bill's gonna do this and addresses this really two, through two means. First, by directing the telecommunication services providers to do, quote, anything or refrain from doing anything that is necessary to secure the Canadian telecommunications system. And as well, it's gonna establish uh, some monetary penalties tied to those changes. Part two of the bill is all tied to the Critical Cyber Systems Protection Act. And it's really providing that framework for the protection of our critical cyber systems that are vital to national security and public safety. And it's gonna do that through five different sort of aspects. First, it's gonna authorize the government to designate those services that are vital to Canadians, those critical sort of services. So what are they? And uh, what are the systems tied to them? The second part is gonna authorize the government to really establish who is going to be responsible to maintain those systems. The third aspect is how are these cyber security incidents gonna be reported? And then how do people comply? How do Canadians and the institutions comply with those changes? Fourthly, it's gonna lay out how information is shared and arguably needed to be protected. And finally, it's gonna give the so what around the enforcements and consequences for non-compliance with the legislation. So in reality, this bill is quite lengthy and very technical. So I'm really gonna focus most of my speech around two important aspects of the bill. One, the threats around cybersecurity, and secondly, around information sharing and the need to protect Canadians' privacy rights and highlighting the importance of transparency and how the government is gonna ensure that not only are they accountable, but any institution that's uh, governed or, or affected by this bill, uh, but in particular the government with the additional powers that this legislation will grant them. So let's get back to Emily. She's a senior citizen, a retired teacher. She uses a mix of online banking and billing, although she still prefers to handle the majority of her financial tra transactions right at the bank. She has a fledging social media presence, mainly to stay in contact with her grandchildren and friends. Heck, she even has a TikTok account at her grandchildren's urging. We'll see if she's gonna change her mind and delete it here sooner than later. Basically, being online and connected is essential to all Canadians now, more than ever, as a lot of Canadians rely on the internet for their daily lives. But it's more than just about conducting business and paying bills. As I've mentioned, you see an increased dependency on the internet and having a, we, we've seen an increased dependence on the internet, especially around government services just in the last few years under this current Liberal government as they continue to shift more and more government services online, unfortunately at the same time decreasing service delivery for those without access to internet. I won't go into details on all the shortfalls that I have with this current approach considering a large portion of rural Canadians still don't have access to high speed or dependable internet. So what threats does Emily face? She complains about getting emails and phone calls from people alleging to be affiliated with her bank or service providers. She wonders about the advertising that shows up on her social media feeds that align with something she, that she only mentioned in an email to a friend. So how is all this happening? To quote the director of CSIS from a December 4th, 2018, over four years ago speech that he gave to Bay Street that I've extracted from Stephanie Carvin's Stand on Guard, Mr. Vigneault stated, quote, the greatest threat to our prosperity and national interest is foreign influence and espionage. While terrorism remains the number one threat to public safety, other national security threats such as foreign intelligence, cyber threats, and espionage pose greater strategic challenges. Professor Garvin in her book clear, clearly lays out the risks associated with cyber attacks, whether malware, ransomware, targeting critical infrastructure, denial of services, and more. She talks about cyber terrorism, 
cyber espionage, and cyber crime. So how do we deal with this? Not only through this legislation, but mainly some of the challenges that we have, and as the, my colleague from Selkirk Interlake Eastman talked about in much greater detail earlier today in his speech, our Canadian Armed Forces, our Canadian Security Establishment, and even our Federal Police Services have ways to deal with this. And But my colleague hinted about sometimes the best defense is a good offense. Offensive cyber operations really isn't the bailiwick of this legislation, although I would offer that there is some overlap as we look at a lot of these threats Canadians and Canadian institutions faced are financed through cyber attacks here at home and more. So we need to tackle this and get the balance right. So the bottom line, Emily and Canadians like her are affected by all of these cyber risks. Again, Professor Carvin points out that at least 10 million Canadians had their data compromised in 2017 alone. Unfortunately, this number is likely underreported and neither the government nor private the private sector fully understands the scale of the problem. To sum up, Madam Speaker, on the threat sides, they're huge. Privacy. Bill C-26 must balance privacy rights while ensuring national security. Increased uh, use of encrypted apps, data being stored in the cloud on servers outside of Canada, IP protection, and more all factor into the challenges in getting this legislation right. In order to deal with these threats, this legislation will need to ena enable our security establishments with robust, flexible powers. However, these robust powers must come with clear guidance on how far and when do they inform the public. This is essential in rebuilding our trust in our democratic institutions. The Business Council of Canada has already publicly expressed concerns over the current draft of this legislation. They rightly identified that large companies and also small and medium-sized enterprises are concerned with the sheer amount of red tape tied to this bill being extremely high. So we need to get this balance right. It's vital and it's going to require significant expert testimony at committee. And although I, I would argue this legislation is desperately needed and I would argue even late in coming, it needs to be done right and can't be rushed through debate or review at the committee stage. Some final comments, Madam Speaker. This legislation is needed to protect Canadians. However, this legislation needs to be reviewed regularly and needs to include safeguards. One of the aspects, and I know it might be a question that the, uh, the member from Winnipeg North will ask if he gets the chance, what amendment are we recommending? Well, there's no annual reporting mechanism in this bill, so the government should have to table an annual report to, par to Parliament outlining the progress on this legislation and include on that an updated cyber threat assessment to Canadians and what they've been hearing back from the companies impacted by this legislation. So well, I'll quote Sean McFade in his book, The New Rules of War, Victory in the Age of Dur Durable Disorder. Secrets and, demo quote, secrets and democracy are not compatible. Democracy thrives in the light of information and transparency." Unquote. Finally, Madam Speaker, I'll, I'll conclude because I never did finish Tom's story and how he's impacted by this technology. The bottom line, he isn't. He doesn't have a cell phone, doesn't use the internet, only pays in cash, doesn't have a credit card, and the only way he's currently being impacted is when he shows up or tries to provide, some, you know, get some federal services from this current government and he can't do it because he doesn't have any of that and he can't get anybody to show up in an office to work. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Here, here. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Pickering Uxbridge. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I w listened intently to the member opposite's speech. He spoke about transparency. He talked about advertising and constituents who uh, wondered how certain ads were targeted to them. And he spoke about annual reporting. So in that vein, I'm curious, Madam Speaker, if the member opposite would like to report to this House anything that the Conservative Party has done to condemn their leader, 
for the misogynistic anti-women hate hashtags that were actually used to target individuals that promoted hate towards women wow. and violence that is a form of domestic terrorism that CSIS has actually highlighted as well. So Madam Speaker, would the member opposite like to talk about um, clarifying in their own house how they're going to address good the question. cyber good attacks answer. against sure women in answer. this country? The Honourable Member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Order. Thanks, uh, Madam Speaker. So I suggest that the member ask the member from Carleton, the leader of the opposition, to answer that question because I can't speak for him other than to state he's put out a very clear definitive statement condemning those hashtags that were put on uh, some videos that he knew nothing about. So Madam Speaker, I'll leave my comments at that. The last time I checked, we're debating Bill C-26 here legislation that is needed to protect Canadians and it needs to be improved and debated and got right so that we can deal with the threats like political interference from foreign states like the communist Chinese government that, are, that is of utmost importance to Canadians. Question, comment, honorable member for Rimouski Nejet, Temiskwata, Les Basques. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I listened attentively to my colleague's speech. Madam Speaker, the Bloc Québécois has often supported the need for the government to tighten cybersecurity controls. But here's what I'm wondering about the Conservative Party, though, Madam Speaker, and here's my colleague for my, my question for my colleague. As you know, there's been a lot of doubt and uncertainty about cyber attacks, for example, in the context of businesses like Huawei. And we know, you know, people know, Madam Speaker, that a former candidate for Conservative leadership worked with Huawei. Worked with them, Madam Speaker. So I'd like my colleague to explain to me what credibility the Conservative Party can possibly have today in the context of talking about Chinese interference and cybersecurity because one of their leadership candidates their own leadership candidates worked with a business like Huawei. Then the Five Eyes have stopped doing business with Huawei. So how can this political party, how can the Conservatives be teaching us about cybersecurity, Madam Speaker? Well, thanks, Madam Speaker. Look, I think the public record of this House and of this party in this chamber has been clear cut on the issue of Huawei, calling out the need for it to be uh, disallowed, taken off devices and not being allowed to be uh, a pr provider here. And that was passed a year and a half ago. Uh, whether or not somebody had private you know, employment prior to them declaring or running in a leadership race, again, great question for the individual. Just because somebody's past history is involved in working for different institutions and companies, I would argue, yeah, we can judge those individuals, but let's talk about the public record here. And I would argue there's been no party in the history of Canada that has stood up more for the defense and sovereignty of this nation than the Conservative Party of Canada. comments, questions et commentaires. The Honourable Member for Battle River Crowfoot. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And uh, you know, a, a common uh, theme that I've heard highlighted well, I think, from uh, from uh, members certainly from the Conservative side, is how uh, past records uh, are one of the best indicators for uh, future success or failure. And certainly, when it comes to the issues surrounding Huawei and cybersecurity, we see Canada, especially its reputation on the world stage, being greatly diminished by the the uh, the actions and, in many cases, inaction of this Liberal government and uh, and and in particular this Liberal Prime Minister over the course of five years. Madam Speaker, my question to to, uh, to my colleague from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, is simply this. Uh, could he expand on how those past actions have diminished Canada's reputation amongst allies and partners? Very brief answer from the Honourable Member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Look, Madam Speaker, look, I, I referenced a couple important books, a couple references by some of our esteemed uh, national security experts across this country. If you read through that and read some books that are out there. This has been a threat that's been building for the better part of a decade or more. And this government's known about this since the day that they formed government. 
and yet we've seen no action. And as I quoted here uh, from the CSIS director from 2018, here we are five years almost later, and, we, and we're now just seeing this important legislation being delivered.